Hey guys, how's it going? So tonight's video is going to be on glycogen storage and degradation. I'm going to try to go through this a little quicker than normal because I really want to get to sleep. So let's start off looking at glycogen in the muscles. Now you've got glycogen stored in your muscle just a little bit. So we look at the path it can take to get broken down. It can be broken down to glucose 1-phosphate, which that tends to be, well it tends to be, that's always the first thing glycogen is going to be broken down to. Uh, then you can you know, transfer the phosphate from carbon-1 to carbon-6 to get glucose-6-phosphate. But all it can really do from there is glycolysis. It can't do gluconeogenesis, can't do glucose. It can't make glucose uh, because it doesn't have this enzyme that we see in the liver, glucose-6-phosphatase. That's You remember one of the enzymes from gluconeogenesis, meaning that you will find it in the liver and a little bit in the kidneys. So let's go ahead and look at the liver. So you can break down your glycogen to glucose 1-phosphate. You can rearrange it to glucose 6-phosphate, which is what you also get from gluconeogenesis. And then your glucose 6-phosphatase will turn it into glucose, which then you can ship out into the blood. So let's look a little bit closer about uh, the conversion between glycogen and glucose. First we'll start off with glycogen, go to glucose, then we'll work our way back. So we've got glycogen, and the first enzyme we are going to use here is, it's actually two enzymes, well, it's actually three enzymes. <laughs> you've got uh, your glycogen phosphorylase, and you've got your debrancher enzyme, which is a transferase, and a, an A16 glucose, glucosidase, glucosidase, I don't know. I've got notes here explaining the first thing that happens is the phosphorylase, it'll move all but four of the residues from the, your chain of glycogen, or once the, the chain or the branch reaches about 11 residues, uh, every time, for every residue, it'll be turned into a G1P. Uh, the debrancher enzyme is going to remove three of the final four residues, and then, which it's the transferase that does that, and then the A16 glucosidase does the final one, and that releases glucose. So you get about one glucose made for every seven to nine G1P made. So that's going to make your, you got your G1Ps there. Phosphoglucomutase is going to rearrange that to glucose 6-phosphate. And then if you're in the liver, which we're just assuming that we are, uh, glucose 6-phosphatase is going to turn that into glucose and kick off an inorganic phosphate. Now to go back the other way, and that's, that whole side is going to be stimulated by glucagon. Uh, that's when you don't have glucose coming from your intestine, you haven't eaten in a while, so your glucagon levels are going to rise and you're going to break down your glycogen into glucose. Going the other way, let's say you just ate a meal, so you're going to turn your glucose into glycogen. First, hexokinase or glucokinase in the liver, it's going to use ATP, turn it to glucose 6-phosphate, and you see it can go off and it can do glycolysis, it can do pentose phosphate pathway or other pathways but we want glycogen. So it's phosphoglucomutase is going to turn it into G1P. From there, the enzyme UDP glucose pyrophosphorylase along with UTP is going to give us UDP glucose, which that can go off and do other things too. So, or the UDP glucose and a glycogen primer can be acted on by glycogen synthase and 4,6 transferase, or otherwise known as a branching enzyme. What that does, the glycogen synthase, or well, it's, well, it's the, this step is the regulated step. Uh, the branching enzyme, it'll move six to eight residues once the chain reaches 11 residues long. So basically, if you think of it as a long backbone, you've got these residues that keep getting added on. Once they get 11 units long, the branching enzyme will move them further down the backbone. So it keeps everything from getting too long and then of course that gives you your glycogen. Now next we'll look at how glucagon and epinephrine will stimulate the breakdown of glycogen into making glucose and we're gonna look at this first explain what happens so when your glucagon levels get high for example if you haven't eaten in a while uh, glucagon or epinephrine will activate a receptor, which that'll activate adenylyl cyclase, which will take ATP and make cyclic AMP, CAMP, 
And that can also go and interact with phosphodiesterase to make AMP, but we're not going to focus on that. So the CAMP is going to bind protein kinase A, which is originally inactive, but when it gets bound by CAMP, it becomes active, and it starts to do all sorts of things. It goes crazy and phosphorylates everything it can find. So in this case, phosphorylation of glycogen synthase 1 or glycogen synthase A which is normally active when it is not phosphorylated. It gets phosphorylated and becomes inactive. Now your glycogen synthase, as the name implies, that's going to be your enzyme Well, that we just saw that it's going to make glycogen. So we're going to deactivate that. You're not going to be making any glycogen. So it's all the protein kinase A is also going to phosphorylate an inactive phosphorylase kinase, which will activate it. Again, that uses ATP because when you phosphorylate something you transfer a phosphate and we know ATP is great for that. So then when your phosphorylase kinase is active it is going to phosphorylate your inactive glycogen phosphorylase B. It's going to activate it into glycogen phosphorylase A. Again that's also going to require an ATP and that is going to act on your glycogen to make G1P which goes down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now over here with the dotted lines, showing you basically what is not going to happen because of the phosphorylation of your glycogen synthase. So well, we, we can go ahead and imagine, let's say your glucagon levels uh, fall, your insulin levels rise, you finally eat a meal. So what would happen then is your Glucagon, your epinephrine aren't going to bind your receptor, you're not going to activate your adenyl cyclase, you're not going to make your CAMP, and you're not going to activate your protein kinase A. That means you're not going to phosphorylate your glycogen synthase, so it's when it's not phosphorylated, it's active. What it can do is it can do can take the uh, UDP glucose on the side here to make glycogen, in which case it would just be stored because that's what you want to do after you eat a meal. So the next part here, we'll go down and we are going to look at another regulation via epinephrine. And again, this is going to, uh, uh, this well this time it's going to deactivate our glycogen synthase, which is, I guess that's what the last one did too. So, we're going to start off with the epinephrine. It's going to bind an alpha agonist receptor. That's going to send transmit a signal via G proteins. The signal is going to reach phospholipase C, which is then going to hydrolyze PIP2 to IP3 and DAG. Now IP3 is going to stimulate the endoplasmic reticulum of the cell to release calcium. Calcium and DAG together, well, they both do this individually. They're going to activate protein, kina protein kinase C, which will then phosphorylate and deactivate your glycogen synthase. Also the calcium will bind calmodulin which will activate two things. First off a calmodulin dependent protein kinase and a phosphorylase kinase that we saw before. Those again will both phosphorylate glycogen synthase um, and the phosphorylase kinase will also phosphorylate and activate glycogen phosphorylase. So again that will stimulate you to break down your glycogen into glucose so you can use it because you haven't eaten in a while. Lastly, and we're going to look at what happens uh, with muscle contraction, how that uh, uses energy. So you contract a muscle, the enzyme myo myosin ATPase breaks down an ATP to an ADP, the adenylate kinase breaks that down further to an AMP, then seen monophosphate. That AMP is then going to allosterically activate your glycogen phosphorylase. So that's another way to break down glycogen. Additionally, uh, when you, a nerve impulse can release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum muscle in the muscle cells. Uh, that's just like before. It's going to bind calmodulin, which can activate your phosphorylase kinase, or epinephrine as we saw in the last time, leads to a release of CAMP, which is going to activate your protein kinase A, which again will activate your phosphorylase kinase. And we remember the phosphorylase kinase will then phosphorylate and activate your glycogen phosphorylase, stimulating the breakdown of 
glycogen into glucose or another intermediate for another pathway if you need. That's glycogen in a nutshell. Hope you guys enjoyed. I'll see you later. I'm going to go to bed.